All right, so let's start. Um, good morning and good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, this is Cherry Kubota, Ohio State University. Um, I am one of the hosts of this um, Indoor Ag Science Cafe. Um, I hope you had a great summer or you are having great summer ongoing. Um, I hope you accomplished some of the things in your long list to do <laughs> during summer. Um, I still have half left and then you know, uh, thinking about you know, how short summer can be. But anyway, back to um, CAFE. I thank you so much um, having the time with us to discuss important technologies and science behind the technology. This is a um, gathering for information exchange and learning uh, opportunity um, uh, about the technologies and science. All right, so uh, funded by USDA and then the uh, four universities are supporting and participating as organizing um, uh, groups. So Michigan State, Ohio State, Purdue University and University of Arizona. All right, so let's start. I'd like to um, go over some of the near term schedule. So we have a really good um, lineup, uh, this four, um, uh, cafe uh, program. Um, the idea this fall, we want to introduce um, some other crops or um, target products uh, uh, that can be grown in indoor farming setting. Although our project, USDA funded project is more focusing on leafy greens, we wanted to talk about something else. So today we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Ricardo Hernandez from North Carolina State University talking about transplant production. And then the next month, September 21st, we're gonna have uh, two professors, uh, Paul Brown and Carrie Mitchell from Purdue University talking about aquaponics. And then we will have Robert Colangelo uh, who is coming back to talk again, but more like a technological uh, uh, progress um, uh, of the vertical farming. And then uh, November, we are still working on it, the schedule. Uh, in December, we will have a plant-made pharmaceuticals uh, vaccine or antigen um, antibody type of production using plants under controlled environment. We have someone who has been working probably 20 years now um, uh, in, in Kentucky, um, uh, Dr. Nobuyuki Matoba, uh, University of Louisville. Um, so anyway, um, lots to talk about in that. Uh, um, in this season. So um, just a reminder, we have an annual Opti Optimia Research Collaborative Update. So this is an opportunity for learning what's the status of this project. So some of the topics we share, the um, preliminary results or the results we haven't even talked in a conference, talk in a conference setting or published. So it's a great opportunity to learn what's going on um, uh, quickly. You need to register, otherwise you are not getting a um, specific link for that participation. So the please register, go to our, our project website and then register for that um, conference. Uh, August 20th, Friday, starting at 10 a.m. Um, Eastern and ending uh, 3 p.m. So it's a long conference, but um, a lot of information. Agenda is also there, you can take a look. So one reminder I was sending, um, I was sending this, um, sorry, I, somebody said he couldn't hear, but um, everyone is hearing me, right? Okay, good. Um, all right, so just a reminder, we are doing a leafy green consumer survey. Um, this is uh, designed and managed by Optimia Economics team at Michigan State, uh, Dr. Simone valdez Souza and then uh, Chris Peterson, Dr. Chris Peterson, um, wanted to know what attributes you consider very important for purchasing leafy green as a consumer, but this group is very unique because you are familiar with leafy green production side and technology side. So in addition to do a real public survey, we wanna do a sort of professional group survey. So the link is slightly different uh, between this one and then also the public one. So if you haven't done that and interested, I think it takes probably more than five minutes. So 
I want you to, you know, uh, uh, you know, expect that probably 10 minutes, I think. Um, but please do so. Um, I don't know if uh, Simone or Chris um, in this cafe today. Probably not. Maybe not. Okay. All right. So anyway, if any questions, just let me know and then I carry that questions uh, to them. All right. So with that, let me quickly introduce Dr. Ricardo Hernandez, um, who is Associate Professor at the uh, North Carolina State University Department of Horticulture. Um, he has been working in uh, transplant production in the controlled environment probably 10 years, Ricardo. Um, and then actually own a company too, uh, one of the founders of a company who is doing a, a transplant production indoor. So he has a excellent experience doing uh, science and then also practicing. So with that, if that is um, good enough for now, you're gonna continue Ricardo, introduce yourself and sharing um, presentation. Excellent, Sherry, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, one more test. Can you see the presentation screen? Yes. Excellent. Well, Sherry, thank you very much for the space and uh, always happy to participate in these uh, outreach opportunities. Um, I'm an associate professor mm -hmm. at NC State University and I've been here for around six years. And a uh, um, big part of my program is around young plants. We also work on uh, full crop cycles in controlled environment. But today I'm gonna share with you some research snips of uh, my program in young plant production. Like Sherry mentioned, I had the opportunity to um, uh, be a founder of two startups. One of them is Graft Growers, and this startup actually produces young plants in vertical farms, uh, mainly focused on grafted plants, but also other, other plants, and it's sold to the market. And Flora, Control Environment Solutions, which focuses on the technology that uh, um, allows uh, for the optimal production of young plants in vertical farms, right? very focused on young plant production. So why seedlings or transplants in control environment? Well, um, they are compact plants. They can be grown under high density. So just because of those two terms, it, it makes them more affordable and uh, um, to be produced in vertical farms. Also, the entire plant is your product, right? You're selling both the shoot and the roots. So your harvest index is the entire plant. So any changes in the environment or any optimized changes directly affect your overall product. Um, and also you can condition these plants uh, um, in some instances to uh, be ready to be, uh, um, um, be transplanted in the field. For example, you may condition them to be more compact. You may condition them to have certain morphology that may uh, um, be suitable for automation or you may condition them to uh, flower earlier. Also, um, the optimal environment young plant stage will impact the final stage environment. There is a research showing that a better start will eventually lead to a better plant. It will also allow you or allow growers to minimize the risk on the young plant stage by uh, giving them um, a shorter cycle in the field by keeping them uh, in, the, in the control environment. And also um, there is environmental strategies that can create the specific morphology. The picture that I have over here is an example of a plant. They're both cabbage seedlings. One of them um, um, is uh, more biomass, more dry mass, more root development. And the other one actually has the morphology that is specifically for automation, right? So the same plant, different morphologies, depending on the goal. And also you have a large market size, right? No, uh, this is a list of the 20 most consumed vegetables. And here in the red square, you have all of those that are now currently um, um, produced from gion plants or transplants, right? So these, these um, products are already in the transplant um, um, uh, production uh, in, in outside the field. So it all, uh, gives an opportunity for for indoor environments to actually produce these transplants now. 
but also I envision with the current changes and challenges of other agriculture that more plants will have that early stage growth in indoor environments. Here also you have the fruits that are now mainly produced out of the top uh, 10 fruits. You have strawberries, watermelon, cantaloupe already produced from transplants or seedlings, young plants. So now um, the way I have um, labeled this indoor production of young plant is precision indoor propagation, PIP, which I define as precisely controlling the environment to precisely control transplant growth. And um, this PIP, you know, it has a few advantages, can increase the production uh, in terms of production per growing area. And everybody familiar with vertical farms can understand that. It can also increase the quality of the plant and, and it can be affordable already, right? So already it can be affordable to be produced completely indoors um, uh, and be price competitive in the market um, uh, for young plants. And also you don't have environmental constraints when you're growing in a PAP environment. So you have here some environmental conditions that you can um, um, affect plant growth. Here you have a grafted tomato plant with two heads produced in a vertical farm. You have temperature, light intensity, light quality or colors or spectrum, CO2 concentration, airflow, nutrient concentration, oxygen or substrate management, water management and humidity, right? And there is other ones that are a derivative from these ones. But I put these icons here to guide you through the presentation so you see which parameters we've been working on in our lab uh, for the specific examples. A lot of you, especially in this group, are familiar with spectral optimization. There is a lot of great work done by a lot of the scientists in this group uh, where you're changing the spectrum to change plant growth and development. Here, um, this is the same thing, right? We're trying to change the spectrum to find the most optimal transplant for lettuce. And this research was done by my former PhD student, Hans Pohls, right? So in general, we're able to um, play with different spectrums, not only the study spectrums, which is the delivery of the light for the entire crop stage, but also dynamic spectrums. And we look at the plant growth and development. And something that is important to understand is that uh, overall yield, fresh mass um, and plant size may not be the most desirable characteristics when you're producing young plants versus when you're producing a full-term cycle plant in a controlled environment. Here you have a picture of plants growing under different spectrums and in uh, um, and, and different um, uh, young plants at 17 days from seeding. In this specific example, you can see here you have a white light with equals amount of red and far red and UV, you know, um, UVA, similar to the sun, which is triggering, you know, um, leaf expansion to increase light capture. You have 100% blue having the same response, and you have 100% red, which even though has a very large leaf area, is not an optimal shape, right? And then you have your blue and red lights. And like I said, there is multiple different combinations that you can, you can lead to. But in this specific example, the lettuce dry mass at the transplant stage, we found that in this specific example, the recipe of 20 blue, 80 red is the most optimal for the young plant production. Obviously, if we carry this out to the entire growing stage of the plant, we may have a different result. But for the young plant production, we identify that this spectrum is best. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of scientists working hard in this area for spectral optimization. But now let's take it to another step. I still wanna focus a little bit about spectrum, but now let's go to tomato seedlings and transplants. This work was done by my uh, PhD student, Brandon Hoover, and was the idea of using far red light, which now we know has a great impact on uh, leaf expansion rate and light capture, as well as a uh, uh, documented impact on increased photosynthetic rate when combined with uh, other power lights. But we wanted to use this far light strategically to improve young plant production. So um, Brandon decided to have a few different spectral recipes. Let me walk you through this uh, slide first. So from day zero to day six from seeding, you have a good combination of red and blue. And then from day six, 
to day 12, um, you have the same combination of red, blue. And from day 13 to day 18, you have the same combination of red and blue. So we're gonna call this the static uh, blue red treatment. We can call this the control. Now, this one is now the static fat red treatment where the first few days, because the plant is still on the cotyledon expansion, Brandon decided to give the same control, the static spectrum of just red and blue. And then from day six to day 18, we added far red light. We have dynamic one, where only far red was added between six, day six and day 12, while zero to six and 13 to 18, the far red was no longer added. And then we have the other combination when far light was only added at the end of that short cycle. So this is what you see here. So shoot dry mass was increased by the static far red compared to all other treatments. And then you have dynamic one, which is when the far red light was added um, on the second uh, part of the spectrum, right? In the middle, when far red was added on the middle, a higher dry mass than the static blue, red, but still lower than your static fat red and similar to your fat red added at the last portion of the growing cycle. Leaf area similar, right? So from these two slides, you may predict, okay, a static fat red is the best to grow this plant. It is the best to have more dry, dry mass accumulation and also more light capture. You are correct. But if we move to the way the plants look and you see your static blue red, your dynamic one, dynamic two, and a static fat red, I wouldn't be able to sell the plants under a static fat red to uh, tomato growers. The plants is just too stretched. It won't last. It won't be able to withstand field or greenhouse conditions. And it's overall perceived as a low quality plant, even though it has more dry mass and more ability to have light capture. So in this specific example, the grower may lean towards a plant that is more compact. So instance, dynamic one is a plant that had higher dry mass than static blue red and also higher leaf area, but still on the compactness threshold that a grower will consider as a good quality plant. And as I showed you before, dynamic one and dynamic two, they had a small difference in dry mass. Having that far red given in the middle being the best strategy for this young plant production. Now let's shift to um, cannabis since it's a, 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 a crop with a lot of popularity these days. And we have a program specifically focused on young plant production of cannabis, especially for the clones. Why? Because it gives the opportunity of um, um, make an impact on the plant with very accurate and precise changes in the environment. So all this work has been done by my PhD student, Christian Collado, and he received all, all the credit. So also um, hemp, um, the plant production of hemp is very um, economic favorable for young plants, for the whole plant, but for young plants. So and these are plugs that either are gonna end up in a greenhouse or these are crops in North Carolina that mainly move to the field for uh, medicinal CBD production for the flower biomass. So clones here, um, the wholesale market is around $4.50 per plant of a rooted clone, right? It can be as low as $2 and it can be as high as $8. And this is just for hemp. This only includes the uh, medicinal market, not the recreational. The recreational market prices are even higher. Now, let me put that into perspective. Tomato, right? Tomato plants, um, um, a, you can, um, we can, we can discuss this, argue this, but you can get around $2 per kilogram of a tomato, right? the actual fruit, right? So that will give you around 60 to $100 per meter square. Lettuce, you can get between six to $9 per, per unit per kilogram of lettuce, and you can get around $269 per meter square. Grafted tomato plug, right? We produce a lot of grafted tomato plants in my business. We can get around $1 per unit. You can range between $1 and 50 cents or $2 if it's organic. So that will yield me around $500 per meter square. 
But if you work on hem plugs, you know, one plug is uh, $4. And if you have in according to the densities that we're talking about, you can get around $1,400 to $2,000 per meter square propagating this space. So obviously there is a high opportunity for revenue. Since these plants allows, because the high value of the plants allows for a great investment on infrastructure, we wanted to look at the impact of light intensity during the rooting of these plants. Right? And we went from a standard 50 micromoles per meter square per second to 400 micromoles, which is very high light level for a plant with no roots, right? But my student wanted to test all high levels. And the hypothesis was very high light intensities will cause plant stress and lower root development, right? Because it's too much light. I didn't even want to go over 100, but uh, my student had this vision. So we went for it. So we have 50, 100, 150, 200, 300, and 400 light intensity levels. Um, the light intensity was controlled, the humidity was managed, and we actually were able to capture the light intensity of every single plug and measure um, and for the entire two weeks periods of rooting. Remember, these are plants that are removed from a mother plant, they have no roots, they're stick, and they're two weeks under these light conditions. To, our, to my surprise, we found that um, um, these young plants were able to make use of the light, even at very high light levels. You can see here a, a response curve of root dry mass. This actually you measure every single root to light intensity. So we found that, you know, close to saturation was between 300 to 400 micromoles per meter square per second, which is very, very high. Um, I'm not recommending these high levels, right? Um, the plant may just root fine under 100 and 200, but my point is that this plant is assimilating this light and not creating an issue for root, root development and growth. And this was also similar for the shoot fresh mass and the shoot dry mass. During that two week periods, when for about a week, the plant had no roots. And the second week, the plant started forming works for that whole two week period. And the these light intensities, the plant was able to respond. We did this with one cultivar. So these responses may be cultivar dependent. This is how the plants look. This is the dry mass of those specific plants. And this is your photon flux density or light intensity for those specific plants. So, um, so now let's move to the combination of light intensity and CO2. And now we move to the production of young plants for watermelon uh, field uh, production. So we're gonna work on the production of young plants. And uh, the idea is, can we use different light levels and different CO2 levels to find a combination that is more affordable for growers? And we have published this paper now in Frontiers for Plant Science. And uh, can you, the idea will be, can you reduce the amount of light if the cost per light is very high, or can you improve both, increase both light and CO2? Because adding CO2 in a contained system is known to be very inexpensive. So we use uh, four CO2 levels, ambient, elevated, and very, very high CO2. Typically, you don't see this kind of CO2 supplementation in crops because it is a long-term adaptation of plants to high levels of CO2. So it's considered to be uh, not efficient or wasteful to add so much CO2 because the plant can have feedback inhibition. But since we're working in young plants and the, the growing cycle is short, we decided to put a very high level of treatment. And uh, three different light levels, you know, they all overall in the low size, even though the label has low, medium, and high here, they all very low light levels. But, you know, 200, is, I consider that to be the minimum um, um, to have a good plant, uh, young plant grown under this light intensity. So look at this plant. This is the interspecific squash carnivore. Around this stage, this plant gets grafted. This is a rooster for a watermelon, right? This is very young straight cotyledons and barely showing the first straw leaf. So my hypothesis was this plant is not gonna make any difference what light or what CO2 levels you give because it's so small, so young. But again, I'm known to reject my hypothesis a lot, which is okay. We know here, this is the dry mass of these young plants and this is the daily light integral, the light. 
So right there, this is the increase in dry mass by the increase of light at an ambient CO2. All right, so well, there is an increase in, measure increase in biomass by increasing light, even mostly when the plant is mostly cotyledons. This is when we increase the CO2, and this is when we increase the CO2 to four times ambient. All right. So at this young plant stage, these plants was very responsive to both light and CO2. So overall, the light increase um, biomass by uh, 28 to 35%, and the CO2 increased the biomass by um, 18 to 35%. So uh, we did the math in all of this, and it just shows us that the highest light and the highest CO2 will allow for the most uh, um, um, profitable system, since growers will also decrease the production time in some of these young cities. So basically, look at it in another way. If you're looking to save more energy or you have limited infrastructure or you don't just don't want to buy a lot of lights, you know, this um, we can also see where how much we can reduce the light by increasing the CO2. So these 13 moles of light, and this will give me this dry mass. These plants I consider a good looking plant in the indoor environment. <clears throat> so that's the control. This is what we want to heat minimum, right? So to get the same biomass, I can increase the CO2 by four times and reduce the light by 38% and we'll get the same biomass, the same growth, right? We're trying to reduce light. Or we can increase it to 1000, you know, and if we go to the, the regression line, we can decrease the light by 19% by increasing the CO2 to 1000 and still get the same plan. When I present this to growers, they're like, I want, the biggest plant, the quickest possible. So then having the, this light and this CO2 became the most um, efficient. Um, we also do some work, um, um, applied work, uh, which are quick experimentals, uh, quick experiments that are directly impact the industry. This is specifically was on just trying different substrate uh, combinations, very, um, general substrate combinations, rock wool, cocoa core, peat moss, and peat moss with 50% perlite. You know, and we just tested the rooting of the different cannabis plants here. This, may, this response is mainly related to water retention and oxygen and moisture capacity. But we found here that for this specific limited research, small research, um, that the combination of peat moss and perlite was better for the rooting of um, cannabis. Then we moved to light intensity, you know, and uh, we were really excited to work in this strawberry crop for indoor environment. Um, there is a lot of effort growing strawberry, um, I'm trying to figure out how to grow strawberries um, efficiently in indoor environments. Um, we do wanna do the same thing, but now we wanna focus on the propagation part of the strawberries in indoor environment because we found that there is a challenge on this propagation uh, of young plants. Uh, some plants, um, and ever varying plants, the yield on how many clones per mother plant is very environment dependent, and it can lead to the poor production depending on weather. Also, the availability of the product is limited and is often uh, a, low, um, um, a supply demand issue, mainly with a, a supply of the of flowers, of the plants. And also every time you get a flower developed, but instead you want a clone, that creates additional labor. Not only that, there is still a huge dependency of soil, born, uh, soil fumigants to prevent diseases when you're propagating these plants and, um, and uh, due to soil borne diseases. So bringing them out of the soil and putting them in, in, in an indoor environment may help the production. So, Growing these plants in an indoor environment, um, we call it again precision indoor propagation, may help you solve some of those issues. So we have a published paper, and um, this this presentation is going to be recorded, so you can go back and read this paper. But this basically, a treater has a proof of concept of the ability for us to grow these plants indoors, and this is the response of how many plants you're getting per cumulative photon flux density for the entire cycle of the propagation either 12 days or 21 days. And we found that in general, we can get five to 10 more 
young plants or cuttings in the same amount of time per plant, right? So this is not this is not density based saying well, I have four levels and I have one table. No, this is five to 10 more cuttings, more clones per plant in the same amount of time in these indoor environments. And to that, you can add the increasing density. And if you want to go vertical, you can do all of that to that. But we already, this is already promising. We also work on light spectrum for this, uh, the production of young plants, working mainly for this specific research on red and blue. And, um, uh, and we found that higher red percent to blue percent was better for the production of clones, slightly better, right? Uh, so here you have two photo periods. You have your eight and a half hour photo period for a short day plan and your 12 hour photo period uh, for, the, for the day neutral plan, um, which is a, um, a quantitative long day. And then you have your main uh, high blue and low blue, right? So we see that growing them under longer photo period was better for the production of young of clones. And also we see a difference between the spectrum with higher red versus the spectrum of higher blue. In higher blue, we're talking about between 32% um, uh, versus around 12% blue, 32%, um, 12% blue. So the 12% blue, mostly red, was better for the production of these young plants. We're also working in another area, um, and this one is specifically uh, the use of air, air velocity, to impact plant growth, morphology, and transplant shock of tomato seedlings in, uh, for field conditions, right? And again, Brandon Uber is the PhD student working in this area. And the idea is that um, sometimes we have found that we encounter, not all the time, and we're starting to figure out the main reasons for this problem, that we encounter um, transplant shock or stress can happen when plants are moved from a controlled environment to the field. Like I mentioned, this is not always the case. You know, we have a lot of data showing that sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but because you don't have the data in the field or the way they grow and manage, you haven't been able to pinpoint the main issue. But, you know, um, from our knowledge, we know that transplaction is often related to the increase of net radiation gain, right? So we're providing photosynthetic photon flux in a controlled environment, in an indoor environment um, for the growth of the plant. And so these plants are moved to the sun. And even though the plant may have no issues with the photosynthetic photon flux density, the overall net radiation gain, right, from those wavelengths over um, uh, 700 nanometers, that can be like 30 or 40% of the spectrum, is now uh, radiation that has to be dissipated for the plant, um, energy that has to be dissipated by the plant. Right, so, um, and the main way to do that is through transpiration rate. If the plant has a healthy transpiration um, uh, rate or capacity, then the plant is better able to handle this. So sometimes when we, do, when we grow plants at very high densities and they stay in the tree for longer amount of time and they're for the reasons they're water more common and they're shaded, then when they move into the field, they have a harder uh, time adapting versus when we have plants that are more compact less plant to plant competition and in the indoor environment, they're more capable of handling that, that transplantation. So we decided, can we use air velocity to um, help on um, the estimate of operation overall transpiration rate, to manage the transpiration rate, to force the plant to actively transpire or actively close the stomachs um, at a good rate before we move into the field. And we decided to do that by changing the air wind velocity around the plant. Um, so we work with air velocities between 0.3 to one meter per second is recommended to minimize the leaf boundary layer resistance and increase your 2 diffusion into the plant, All right? So those are where you wanna have them when you grow them in an indoor environment and overall the plant will go uh, healthy and will maximize the use of any resources such as CO2 supplementation. So we actually tested 0 0.5 meters per second, one meter per second, two meters per second, and four meters per second, all from a vertical delivery or error, vertical error delivery. 
and we grew tomatoes um, um, under high densities for this. So here you can see this is the control. And now this is a, a single plant. We didn't grow them as single plants, we were in a tray. So that move may maybe too, too fast. Now this is here, the one meter per second. And then over here will be the two meter per second. And over here you will have the four meter per second that it was just too much, too much rain. And then we grew these plants under different recipes. We grow them under constant, you know, optimal light uh, velocity, weight, high velocity, either two or one or four, close to the end of the, of the growing period, right? We also grow them under static, where they were grown under these specific conditions for the entire length. And obviously under static, which is the research I'm gonna to present to you right now, the impact of air velocity had a direct impact on plant growth. And we knew, we knew this was gonna happen. Um, but we wanted to see the impact of that under um, shock conditions. To then come back and develop an experiment where we can time the air velocity response to try to maximize um, transplant, uh, minimize transplantation. So here you have the plants. This is grown under static. Today I'm going to show you the static result air velocity. You have here, you can obviously see the total height is reduced by the increase of air velocity. This one overall looks more, a lot more stress. So it was 24% decrease on our air velocity of two meters per second of plant height under the static delivery of air velocity and 34% decrease. And that 34% decrease, a combination of both height and also biomass. So here you have uh, the dry mass, um, the dry mass of the plant is statistically the same. You know, if you run a linear regression here with, the, with the, all the replications, it's significant with the increase of air velocity, you have a slope that decreases dry mass when you just analyze them like these are similar, um, but there's a huge impact on plant morphology. So what happens, you know, after the plants go in this treatment and then we move them to more, field-based shock, and not only field-based shocking, um, transplant shock potential conditions. So we set up a chamber uh, where we have light intensity, very, very high levels, and also fluctuating similar to the sun. Here you go, the fluctuation in times, you go, um, this is a 24 hour cycle, and you go all the way up to 2000 micromoles, and then you come down again, right? Now the temperature was very high here. Let me see if I put the temperature on the next slide. No, but the temperature that we put here was also 28 degrees Celsius. So uh, quite warm um, for the plants, but nothing that the plant cannot handle. And then we grow them only for seven more days, right? Because we have a limitation on space and we just wanted to see the response. So the 20 day old seedling grow under various air velocities was transplanted to a bigger pot and grown for seven more days under the chalk conditions, very high solar radiation. And here you have the dry mass after seven days later. And obviously the plants that started with higher biomass, um, they have also higher dry mass at the end of those seven days. So from this specific result, you say, Ricardo, you did all of this for nothing. Yeah, maybe, because at uh, seven days, you still, if you started with um, low air velocity, high air velocity, that plant's still not able to recover under these conditions. <clears throat> but we looked this, uh, we looked this at a percent change, right? What is that relative growth rate um, uh, between the time you put them in the very stressful conditions to the time we harvest them out of the very stressful conditions for only seven days, right? So we found that the plant had similar a percent change in, in biomass, uh, in dry mass, right? So I was expecting a much greater penalty on the higher air velocities. And also the leaf area change was much greater um, there at those with, um, I'm sorry, not much greater, just uh, show a slight improvement under higher air velocities. So um, not very conclusive. Uh, we don't know if, um, number one, we don't know if the, if the higher velocity will actually improve the um, adaptability to transplant shock, 
The plants under two and four velocity were measured for stomatic conduction and transpiration rate, and they have higher ability, higher stomatic conductance, but still that didn't translate to growth. So we look to uh, spend more time on this research. So this is the presentation that I have. Um, I have a um, few more minutes to spare, um, and I open the floor for any questions. Sherry? Thank you so much, Ricardo. I really appreciate a lot of information. Um, quite interesting.